And so mindset is the key to replace those limiting beliefs with more empowering, productive, and constructive beliefs, and then create new habits and thus new results. So you can have the greatest strategies in the world, but if you're not available for the abundance out there, if you're not a vibrational match for all the good stuff, if you're not confident or you don't feel worthy, the best strategies in the world won't matter. But on the flip side, you can have a lack of strategies, but a great mindset and you're available to figure things out, to be resourceful, to be creative, to, to work, to put yourself out there, to make things happen, to try new things, to, to meet people. So mindset is everything. Of course, there is a percentage that is strategies and tactics, but none of that will matter if your mindset's not right. I think one of the most effective ways to address uh, fear is to find someone that has overcome that very thing. Find a mentor or someone that is a couple steps ahead of you that can give you some insight on some of the things that may be coming for you ahead. I feel like that is the most effective way. I will say this. I can't leave that question without saying this. There is a tendency of, for us, and people have heard this term, you know, paralysis by analysis or, you know, analysis paralysis, meaning like you get so fixated on trying to identify every consideration prior to making the move. What if this happens? Or what if this happens in this contingency plan and this contingency plan that many times that slows our action down. So I'm not saying you don't need to consider anything. What I'm saying is the fastest way to find out the, 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 the high value considerations is to find a mentor, somebody that is there that has went there. When I was in that state and trying to make music, I stumbled upon the idea that we know music affects us, that we know. But what I stumbled upon was something deeper. And it's the idea of our minds making associations with different sounds in different ways. So the same sound, how I will associate with it, could be totally different from how you associate with it. Um, and that has deeper repercussions than the sound itself. It's we who give something meaning, uh, whether it's sound or visual or food or, uh, you know, um, nice perfume or aroma or bad smell. We, our minds give meaning to it in a certain way. I would say leadership, mid-level and top of the house is where we see some of the biggest barriers. I think that when we talk treetop to roots, as we do at Indelible, it's about board of directors, senior leadership, you know, mid-level all the way down to your individual contributors. But oftentimes, I think one of the choke points in organizations is that sometimes leadership views that, well, this is at the staff level, right? And so let's get the staff level kind of dealt with. Let's impart this at the staff level. And it's like, well, it's important, number one, that everybody owns DEI. It can't manifest, be sustainable or successful unless everybody's got skin in the game and everybody's responsible to develop it, to grow it, and to sustain it. But if we don't have the culture, especially established by our leadership, then we don't have the example. We don't have the tools in, in place in our everyday work day. So just thinking of things like a leader who has a one-on-one -on -one with someone that they support, making it a walking and talking meeting, getting outside in some sunshine. The, that is such a little step, but it makes such a huge difference. Vitamin D and sunlight is equivalent to the energy of a cup of caffeine. And, you know, moving our body the motor cortex of our brain is right next to the creative problem solving part of our brain. So you will generate better ideas by moving. And little things like that just can not only create a culture of health for those that you're in your workplace, but you get better results in the business. Talk about fulfillment and meaning and purpose. One of the first books I read when I first started exploring this area was Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And he was a Holocaust survivor and he did lots of research and found that actually it's meaning 
that drives us, that gives us that purpose in life. It's not happiness. Happiness, yes, we all want to be happy, but it is having that thing to live for, the big why, I suppose, as Simon Sinek would say. For me, when I Googled the definition of success, of course you see fame, fortune, and all that, you know, the wealth and social status, which you would expect. But number two <laughs> is the accomplishment of an aim or a purpose. So actually success is the accomplishment of an aim or a purpose, which means success is your purpose, but it means you have to, you need to identify what your aim or purpose is. Because once I define what leadership is, then I know what I'm going to pursue and how I can prepare myself. So if I think it's only about a person that has a title, boss, manager, you know, CEO, then I think that I can't be a leader until I've attained that. But if I understand that leadership starts with influence at any level, that means I can be the person that doesn't have a title and still lead. We've seen that people in society, we look at a, a Rosa Parks, or we look at anybody that didn't have a formal authority, but changed history, right? So leadership, understanding what it is, is the first step. How do, will you define it as an individual? I say a, st a second step, which usually comes much later for people, is what Dr. Ron Heifetz taught us at the Harvard Kennedy School. He said that as a leader, you lead without a framework at your own peril. You feel lost within your own skin. You feel lost within your own life. And you start making the excuses or the, well, I should just be grateful or I should be happy or I have it better than. That's probably all true that you have it better than somebody. but your gift is you. Your gift you have to give to others is you. So if you want the full expression of you, your leadership, what you have to offer, and especially high performers, like they want that impact. They want soul plus success, not just success, but here I am and I want to give all of me and I want to experience all of me and I want to give that to my kids and I want to give that to my marriage and I want to give that to my community. But when part of you is suffocated, it's locked up, it's muted, it's not available. It's there, it's within, but it's not available. So it's that I feel lost, I feel squished. The fact that you're even questioning it is letting you know something's not working. Yeah, this is what I love about the formula and the way it's been structured. And a side note that when my brother created this formula, I started looking at it as how can everyday people apply it, not just athletes or leadership that's already primed for this style of mindset, but how can everyday people, how can I elevate like the moms and dads and kids and the dynamics of raising kids in this day and age? How can I really up level everything I do? What we realized is in the quantum field of energy, negative and positive ions, elements, atoms, we all kind of understand that. But what I felt we were missing, which is the brilliance of why Chris added in neutrality, is we all need this resting ridge, right? We need a place to just catch our breath, take a step back, because most of us are not skilled at this moment to move from negative to positive, in the snap of a finger. Over a period of six months, I looked at all of the interviews I'd done, and this is what emerged. If the first is not recognizing your special talents, abilities, and accomplishments, 63% of women said they have this gap. Number two is communicating from fear, not strength, 70%. Number three, reluctance to ask for what you want and deserve, 77% of women said they have this gap. Number four, isolating from influential support. 71% say they're isolating from that kind of support. Number five is acquiescing instead of saying stop to mistreatment. 48% said yes, which is almost half. Number six is losing sight of the thrilling dream you had for your life. 76%. And finally, number seven is allowing the past to continue to shape you. 62%. Credibility is crucial. And credibility, it, it doesn't happen in a week and it doesn't happen in months. Coming to that place of credibility, coming to that place of influence, that what precedes is a very long personal journey. And I believe in that. It's, it's a very internal journey and a lot of things that can basically be left behind. And when it comes to really of you seeing 
sometimes you go on LinkedIn or any other social media and see these wonderful women who are just portraying this ultimate confident image of of statue and it's basically that is the woman that you would inspire to be but you don't really understand of the decades of work that goes into becoming that woman we don't grow when we are in the comfort zone this book didn't evolve because i was comfortable this evolved because I challenged myself to see life different and to remove myself from the victim that was pinpointing who is guilty of what instead of, you know, moving on to a position where I am acting as the leader that I am and I am challenging myself on how I will fix this, how I will make it different. So you need grit to go there. You need that internal fuel to, to keep pushing yourself you know, outside the limits because when we go outside the limits we can hurt ourselves and I, I'm not suggesting to to do this in a way that you hurt yourself and you don't sleep you don't eat right but we need to be out of the box where we feel safe in order to develop new skills in order then to find out what are we made from? So when it comes to structuring a career move, it's about developing a plan. But before you get to that, you want to think about why do I want to make this move and what do I want to do, right? So so when it comes to career transitions, being very intentional and clear on what you want to do next is very, very important. And sometimes that may require upfront therapy, uh, personal evaluation, because for people, whether it's in the military, whether it's in a toxic workplace, whether it's athletes, that sense of loss and feeling of loss of identity and other things can plague your ability and can cloud your judgment as to thinking, of what's next. So taking that upfront time to get clear, to get mentally well is important. Um, and then you can determine, well, what do I want to do? And why is this important to me? To be pressure free is mean, it means no matter what pressures or challenges or situations you encounter, you stay free of triggering the stress response. That's that fight or flight stress response that literally keeps us captive for hours in a state of being that is not optimal. So I really talk a lot about optimal performance and optimal mindset, not hap not positive or negative, but optimal. And I came up with that because as a violinist and a serious classical musician, I'll be working on a piece of music. I'm not necessarily happy. I am so in the zone and I am so in this thing. And I'm thinking, wow, I really want to talk about optimal mindset. You may be doing something very serious, so you're not that ha 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 happy kind of thing. And I also feel like today there's a lot on happiness and people feel that they feel anxious that they're not happy enough. I believe that there's so many of us who are kind of timid to put our faith out there on social media. And that's where I come in and say like, hey, I've been able to do it successfully. Here's how you can go about that, right? And I, I see it more. Like you said, you didn't really see a lot of faith-based content other than actual preachers and pastors, right? Now you see a lot of influencers and content creators who may not have, you know, they didn't go to seminary school or they did, don't have that background in, the, in preaching in church, but we all have a voice, right? And I think that it was just, a great pivot for me because it got me out of my comfort zone and it allowed me to um, follow God's will. One of the things that we do at Rizzo's Protective Group is we provide a training called tactical termination because just like you mentioned, a lot of times people don't know how to terminate people with tact. And we have a, a training module that talks exactly to that point about training with tact because Maybe a person wasn't the best employee, maybe they were late, maybe they earned their firing or their termination, whatever the, the reason was, at the end of the day, that person is a human being and we as leaders in the enterprise, we have to train people in the HR space how to terminate with tact because you don't want an individual to come back to your facility with anger issues, with aggression, and with a weapon looking to uh, to get even or to even a score with someone. You know, everyone nowadays needs a brain. There is, it's not, not an option anymore. If you want to compete long-term in a marketplace, so it's all about the brain. And 
a brand is something that makes your customer feel about you. So a strong brand is if a customer has, has strong, positive feelings about you. It's not just about what they think about you, what they talk about you. It's about what kind of feeling do they have when it comes to you as a brand? How do they experience you? What is their relationship? It's about the unique relationship that you as a brand have with your customer or with your potential customer. So it's really about the feeling that counts here. And that is very much underestimated. Health and wellness from a leader's perspective is a lot more than just the physical, right? Most people hear health and wellness, they associate fitness with it. So you hear like the health, wellness, fitness, health, fitness, wellness, some combination of those three, right? And it's more than just physical. It was actually funny. I was with a client this morning and we were training and, and my client was venting right? Expressing how they felt emotionally about certain situations. And after the session, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry for venting. I'm like, no, that is what we as trainers do. We provide the physical tool, but that physical tool that we're providing, whether it's a program, whether it's training with you, whether it's creating a plan with you, then facilitates the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, those other aspects, because the physical allows you to open up those other avenues, right? So health and wellness for leaders is about the overall individual, right? As a leader, I was, you know, in the Marine Corps, in Bloomingdale's, at my gym, even now. So in, in, in just general life, my mission is to make sure that my people and everyone that I work with, that works for me, that I work for, grows and gets better. And, and what I tell people is I keep my circle extremely small. However, they have a circle that they keep small. Right. And that expands. I know here in Vegas, at least, I tell people we're, we're, we're almost as big as the city is, right? We're, I think we're approaching the 3 million mark in population, but the business community is extremely small. So we're, we're literally two degrees from separation. Um, so, you know, different ways to network is just knowing who you're trying to target, right? As far as who am I trying to build a relationship with? Who are the people that, I see making a difference in, in the community and making an impact and wanting to do change for the good and getting close to those people, right? It's, it's, it's the books we read, the people who we associate with. If you take the time to nourish that in the next five years, your life can transform. What we have to offer is the EVP and the value proposition. And there are three different types of brands, right? So we're gonna touch on employer brand. And so thinking, think about that through what's the value the organization has to offer as an employer. But a, a lot of times people are seeing personal brand and you also have to have val your values aligned to that. So what do you have to offer as a person, right? You're the entity. And then the last, uh, the last brand is a business brand. So small business or, or large, uh, larger organizations, how do they um, attract clients and investors? So those are the three different uh, types of brands. They all have to have a, a value proposition. You know, what is that compelling reason that people want to buy from you or hire from you? I've probably almost died like nine, 10 times in my lifetime. And I've been spared. And then the question is why? Why have I been spared? Why didn't I die when I was a little kid, when I had so many different accidents? Why didn't I die when I was a teenager? Because I matter. I need to do something with my life. So when we start looking deeper into who I am, that's where the self-worth truly, truly comes out important to talk about the your identity and self-concept and like how you perceive yourself because based on that you're going to position yourself in a way on social media um, and LinkedIn has a very very big thing with positioning if they perceive you as a low value or like that you're selling low ticket that means that something in your positioning your message is off so every time with my clients and with my community, I always tell them like position is the, the very first step towards having consistent and high quality clients on LinkedIn. They need to go onto your profile, do a very vertical, um, like quick read of your profile and be like, yeah, that person can, can help me. I feel like positioning is a huge, huge thing that a lot of people are struggling with. The truth is that I did not know what self-care was 
just a few years ago. When I did my TED Talk, it was because I was going through a devastating life circumstance. And at the time, I found that I was really strong. And I kept getting knocked down and kept getting back up and figuring things out, taking care of the kids and everything I needed to do. And and people would say, you know, I can't, I can't believe you're doing it. I don't know how you do it. And the truth was, I didn't know how I was doing it either. I was very strong, but I, I've learned and I can see now where I was not healthy. In the years that followed, I recognized that I was in situations that the only common denominator was myself. And I knew that I had to figure out how to change that, really. So there's a lot of situations where you're trying to execute an event, but you're not necessarily the only person. An event requires so many different bodies with so many different backgrounds and, and accolades and experiences and all that kind of stuff that you have to work with in order to be able to bring that out. But the other thing is that events are so personal and it takes interpersonal skills in order to, one, read the room, but also understand what your client is wanting you to do, even though they may not be able to articulate that the right way, right? And so trying to get their messaging and putting that into an event atmosphere, I feel like is really, you that, that could be a whole degree if, if you wanted to, because it's an art to it. The helmet catch was really the culmination. One quick, neat story is, um, uh, you know, when I was in college, I made a bonehead play. And a reporter was kind of driving me about it. I don't know. I didn't know what kind of article he was trying to do, but I ran into the punter and that's not a smart play. And um, he was asking me about it. And I said, well, I'm not trying to play the game just to be an average guy, just to be a guy that I'm trying to make a play. I want to be remembered. And he titles the article, Tyree wants to be remembered. So now fast forward the clock to 2008 against the undefeated Patriots. In one moment, you know, God kind of get crowns me with a moment that most people have to have a Hall of Fame career to be a part of the NFL narrative. So I'm, I'm really blessed and fortunate that, you know, God had plans for me that were far beyond my own imagination. The main reason we mute ourselves is because of fear. So fear of judgment, fear of rejection, fear of not being good enough, fear of failure, fear of what people will think of us, fear of, ooh, that's not who they expect me to be, so I can't do that because I'm supposed to be this person, so I can't do that. And so we have all these rules that we make up in our head about, or rules that society has told us of how we need to be. And as a result of that, we end up showing up as a less expressed version of ourselves. And it starts with this internal suppression. And I think a lot of people are unaware of their own thoughts or feelings or needs because they've been so focused on making sure they, everybody else is okay that they're not focused on their own stuff. And that's not selfish to do that. It's necessary. The people that can be the most helpful long-term or the people that are connected to themselves. And I was very lucky because I had fantastic parents, especially my father. He's a, a doctor because he's still alive. Um, he's in his 90. And um, he was the one that all the time was saying to me, you can be whatever you want. And uh, when I remember my mom says, come and do things at home. And my father says, let her because she's good, uh, good student, uh, good on on um, on literary issues. Let her to do what she wants. And I never feel in my own home that I could be stopped by, by someone. It was very very important. I needed to practice. I needed to feel embarrassed because when you start talking, you have all attention to you, and you have very little time to get it across and if you are not assertive then you're not being considered as well you don't have a valid point let's move on to the next so it was important and i failed and i failed and and you know i made mistakes i might even mispronounce words but i knew that i had to get there that i had to do it in order for me to okay one step and then one person better and then one person many people out there including myself at times, we relate to responsibility as a burden, as an obligation, as something we have to carry. Uh, and when that is, is showing up in different areas of our life, we don't step into what you just explained, 
the choosing, the taking that step, making those decisions and really uh, creating those results that you want for yourself. So if we take it back into the leadership space, you say, well, if you don't have a healthy relationship with responsibility where you are honoring your autonomy, you are choosing, you are moving uh, you, uh, towards those things that you need to make decisions around, you won't be a leader. Newsflash, often leaders think their only role is signing the check, is giving away budget or doing the rah-rah at a town hall, but it's so much more than that. So there are five main roles a leader has during change. The first is communicator. Number two is liaison. Um, number three is advocate. Four, which is very important, is resistance manager. And last but not least, they need to be a coach. I believe that every single person is a comparaholic. And if you think about what is a comparaholic, it means that at some point in your life, you are allowing comparison to take control over you. So as a leader, what does that look like? It takes many different forms. Sometimes we're taking control by listening right now. We're thinking, ooh, you know what? His podcast is so much better than mine. <laughs> or maybe we're thinking she looks better than I do or vice versa. Comparison is something that when we give it roots in our life and we allow it to have control as a leader, then what happens is our focus is no longer on the goal. We lose focus of everything important and we go inward. But I believe that we are the only ones that hold ourselves back. If we are in a chapter of our lives and we're not satisfied, then we are the ones that has created the opportunities that are in front of us at that moment. And we have the power at any moment to change the trajectory. And so I would say the way that you can tell is if you're unhappy, if you're unsatisfied, if you're restless, if you feel called to do something greater, that's what happened to me eight years ago. I just, even though I was making all this money and I was a top performer and I had all the nice material possessions, something inside of me was crying for more. I, my body was aching for something different. So if you're a leader of a company and you're, you're trying to convey an important message or you know, you're speaking in your boardroom or whatever it may be, I would, you know, they need to take ownership of the role. They need to, you know, people, and I've, I've seen it so many times that people want to follow a strong leader and people will quit a job based off their boss. You know, if, if they don't respect their boss, admire their boss, understand their boss's vision, feel feel that the person leading them is invested. And I think a lot of these um, emotions and feelings can be heard within the voice. What I find in terms of a world perspective is that whenever we're traveling and arrive in a new place, it is not our home. We are visitors there. We come as visitors no differently than arriving on someone's doorstep. And my feeling is we must always ask permission. In order to gain a world perspective, we need to listen to the voices on the ground. We need to understand where their struggles are, what their deepest yearnings are, what their needs are, to be able to better serve them. And until we do that, we will never gain a world perspective. Yeah, and sometimes some of the examples you might include in the video is something that, you know, maybe it is something that the team is doing, but also showing examples of other teams. So you're not saying, you don't, you know, you're not pointing the finger at your team because sometimes people feel like you're pointing the finger at me. But we love, we love when you praise us. And when everybody's like, oh my God, your name got said, like you got shouted out. Oh, that's awesome. And even yourself, when you see that, there's a sense of pride, like, okay, I'm going to keep doing this because now others can see and learn from me. Fasting is really great for men and women. I, my practice mostly caters to women, but I got a lot of guys that reach out to me or watch my videos and many of the things I talk about can apply to them as well. But fasting is really great for anti-aging, anti-inflammation. It helps with blood pressure, with weight loss, with type 2 diabetes, right, which is super prevalent in our Latin culture. Obesity, I mean, it helps with all of it. Insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, which is an umbrella term for high cholesterol, being overweight, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, 
all those things that really take us out, right? Especially in the Hispanic community. Fasting can really address all of those things in a natural way where you can get off of your medications. You can avoid being put on medications if you're able to start to follow and practice a really great fasting routine for yourself. For me, creativity as a form of expression but not so much in the sense of art or creating art. It can come from art, but it can be more of the expression of how you talk, how you walk about your intention, your purpose in life and what you're doing, whether it's your business or you're working for someone else and how you work as a team. Creativity is in so many places that we often don't see or perceive, but it really drives so much of how we are wired and our purpose and what drives us. So I feel creativity can be liberating, empowering, and it has the power to change someone's life, whether sometimes they know it or they don't. Everybody had a side hustle. My mom, she had two side hustles growing up. You're at E4 trying to support a family in the early 80s. The dollar just doesn't go a long way. So she made cakes and she did hair. And our house was always full with people either picking up cakes or she was doing hair. So for me, I observed that and I never understood until probably when I was a preteen why she's in the army. Does she have to do this? I go spend the night in my friend's house. His mom will be doing hair or doing something. So every family, they're coming over to play dominoes. Somebody's got a side hustle. So these are things that I observed specifically within our community because we were so tight you gotta imagine having this like strength inside of you that forces you to get back up and I've had to do that so many times in my life over and over again and it's a choice and I and as I'm speaking to you right now I can see those moments where I was going can I do it one more time but I know, you know, I've had uh, four near-death experiences. I've been part of a paper and research. I know that I'm here for a reason, or otherwise I would have been dead a long time ago. I embrace life every day, and I'm gonna, all these goals and purposes that I have that have nothing to do with me, but how they're going to benefit the world or how they're going to help people, it's a choice I make every day. And it's, some days, listen, some days it's not easy. Whatever results we're currently getting is a reflection of our current level of consciousness. We cannot get better results beyond our current level of consciousness. So in order to get better results, we need to raise our level of consciousness. And believe it or not, um, we're only actually conscious about three to 5% of the time. The rest of the time we're relying on our habits to determine the bulk of our behavior and our results. So. Becoming more conscious enables us to make better choices, and it also enables us to connect at a, at a deeper level with ourselves and each other, and that leads to better results. I think the biggest thing that I learned during the Marine Corps in terms of leadership was the principle I shared with you. Know yourself and seek self-improvement. You know, constantly check yourself. There used to be a, uh, a mirror at the... Uh, at the hatch, as we call it in the Marine Corps, when you're getting ready to leave the barracks, you had to check that gig line, check, and, and I never will forget the words that said, if someone accused you of being a United States Marine, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And I live by that. It's that creed of, you know, I wanted to make sure that I got convicted and found guilty of being a Marine. So it was in my attitude. It was in my anticipation of being involved and engaged. And I think what we look at now is, Having the right attitude takes you a long ways. First of all, we have to forgive ourselves. One, we need to forgive ourselves for believing those truths. And we need to forgive ourselves for speaking those truths over ourselves. Then we need to forgive others, the ones that said it, or the action that caused the trauma, the people that caused that trauma. We need to forgive that. There's a third one, and that's God because oftentimes we blame God for certain things, even for bringing people into our life, for allowing circumstances and situations. Those are things that we need to address. 
Well, I think that everybody has different core beliefs and different ways that they believe and see things, but most of those are going to support your mindset. If you have a core belief to be of service, if you have a core belief of integrity, if you have a core belief of empowering others, those are all going to influence your mindset and the way that you approach everything that has to do with your life. So to me, they just layer on and enrich it. Well, you know, I think there's some basic tenets. You have to start with leading yourself, right? Uh, and if you're if you're not going to lead yourself and manage yourself to be the best that you can be, you're never probably going to ever attain a position where you can lead others. In most cases, that's a right that you earn. And some of the you know core elements that I think are important are you know things like respect. Respect for others, respect for position, having a strong work ethic is absolutely critical. I don't care at what level of the organization you're at. If you want to be successful, you have to have a strong work ethic. I think you have to have integrity along with that. And um, I think you also have to have a high degree of accountability and reliability. I find mentors to help me in areas that I'm vulnerable in. So if I was a drinker, I'd go to AA. And I'd say, you guys, I'm heading into the, into the holiday season. How are you guys doing? And I would find somebody that I could call and talk to every day prior to the, the crisis that's awaiting me. Or I would read or listen to podcasts, but I would change what I put in my head so that I'm strengthening myself for adversity every day to grow mental resiliency versus all of a sudden wait one day hoping it'll just show up in my life. And they go, oh, I got it today. I did it. Usually that doesn't happen. And so I'm, I'm talking to folks about maybe wisdom. What can you do to grow? How to grow? What do you want to grow in? Who's going to help you with that? And give me a plan that you want to have that this Christmas is going to be different than last Christmas.